Good evening. Is that working? I can never tell. My name is Harry Brown. I'm with the Leadership and Professional Development Department. And uh, we want to welcome you to this, uh, this evening with um, Since this is not class and you're here voluntarily, the mask protocol, as I understand it, you don't have to have them. So if you want to take off your mask, you can. I want to just uh, draw your attention to begin with at uh, something new that we are starting. Uh, Purdue Ties is a platform which is sponsored by Purdue for Life, which is the Alumni Association. Every single one of you can join the Alumni Association right now. You don't have to wait until you actually graduate or leave Purdue. If you join that, then you have the opportunity to become a member of the Leadership and Professional Development Community. There's links on our website that so makes it easy for you to find that. So if you register for Purdue Ties, you can join our community, and that will allow you to continue to participate in programming uh, such as coffee chats that we're going to be sponsoring throughout the semester, for the rest of the semester, and continue your exploration of uh, the uh, competencies and preparing for uh, professional and uh, positions and leadership positions. So I urge you to go there. Uh, we'll send you a link uh, to uh, the uh, page on our website that you can easily get to Purdue Ties and register. And now I want to turn it over to Jamie. Hi everyone, my name is Jamie Cox. I work with SAO Upstairs, Student Activities and Organizations, um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our guest today. Um, so Dr. Jenna Rickus is the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning at Purdue University. She's a professor of agricultural and biological engineering and a professor in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering with expertise in biofunctional materials and biosensors. Dr. Rickus is an alumna of Purdue and spent time in, in, in industry as an engineer at Kraft Foods before receiving her PhD in neuroscience and neuroengineering from UCLA. As a faculty member, Dr. Rickus has also invested significantly in building, growing, and strengthening academic programs, classroom teaching, and transformational experiences for students. She founded the Purdue International Genetically Engineered Machine, iGEM, undergraduate research team, and is a member of the Howard Hughes Science Education Alliance, bringing authentic research into the classroom. Dr. Rickus has won numerous awards for her teaching, ad advising, and research. In 2016, she was named a University Faculty Scholar and a Diversity Catalyst, and was inducted into the Purdue Innovators Hall of Fame. In her current role as Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, Dr. Rickus provides leadership to Purdue campus in undergraduate education and student success. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jenna Rickus. Can you just follow me around and say nice things about me? Occasionally, when I'm down and feeling low, okay, here, let's see this down a bit. I'm a loud speaker anyway. So my family tells me, okay, so they asked me to come talk to you all about ways of thinking. Is that too loud? Just probably turn it down a little bit. Turn it down. Do I have a volume on here? Do I have control of the volume or do you? How's that? Is that okay. better? Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, so I want to be conversational with you guys, and I'm not going to death PowerPoint you um, and have a little bit of conversation. So um, I thought we would kind of start by getting to know each other just a little bit um, to get, you know, you've heard sort of that bio, but um, I'll share a little bit about me, and then I want to hear a little bit about you guys and sort of your motivation and maybe what you're hoping to get out of today, why you're, why you're sitting here you could be doing one of the other million things that I know you guys all have to do. So, um, you know, I'll maybe just start a little bit about leadership. So, it was, Jamie mentioned that I was an undergrad here at Purdue, and I would say that my time um, and with the, the leaders of student life at the time, the, the Stephanie's and the Harry's of the world back then were really the seeds and foundations. Leadership has been sort of woven, I think, um, influence every aspect of, of everything I've done in my life, whether it had been in industry, um, as a research engineer, as a student, as a grad student, as a teacher and instructor here. 
Um, and and now more I'm in a formal title leadership role again, but I would say the sort of lessons and competencies that you're learning through this program are so foundational for all sorts of things that you're going to do. Um, so I wanted to sort of share that, that at the time, Associate Dean Dean Hamlin, who was the Associate Dean of Students, um, was super foundational. So much that I've learned and applied, um, I can go back specifically to things that I learned from her, from the Dean of Students Office and the teams there. So I just kind of want to share that little thing about me and relationship to this program. So you guys, Tell me, maybe, you know, and every single person doesn't have to tell me, but let's maybe somebody want to share, you know, why are you here broadly? Why are you participating in this program? And maybe really specifically today, what, you know, you might hope to get out of in today's conversation. Any thoughts? Yeah. I'm here on scholarship with the Indian Department of Transportation. Oh, really? For my second year. And one of the things, I'm going back for civil engineering this time. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to learn was more about And I should say, tell me your name. Robert Beecher. Robert Beecher. Uh, my I have a fun fact about me connection. Um, that's awesome. I kind of went, ah, oh, Indian, Indian, Indian. My dad was a civil engineer from Purdue, sort of the first to go to college in his family. I was super influenced by that. I interned at Indot, and he worked at Indot his entire career. So I have lots of, um, I sort of came to engineering because yeah, I would sit with my dad counting cars and doing all kinds of traffic <laughs> projects. <laughs> when I was little, so lots of great connections. There, awesome. Somebody else? Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Bhagya. I'm a graduate student uh, working uh, in physics department. Yeah. Um, I have been in some leadership roles. That is, I'm trying to say why I am here, but uh, I wanted to see what other competencies, competencies as a career skill I can get from or learn from here uh, and apply that to my um, whatever program I'm in, as any part or any phase in my life. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, excited to be here and learn about new things, yeah. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. Anybody else wanna share? Any undergraduate students in the room? Yeah, we've got a couple. Does one of our undergraduate students wanna share? Okay, okay, great, we got him. Yeah, my name's Jackson. Um, I'm kind of just here trying to explore uh, more opportunities. Uh, Purdue has so many great things to offer, and uh, you know, you get, at the end of the day, you just try to take advantage of those things. Okay. Um, so that's why I decided to come. Yeah, and that's okay that you're exploring. Um, that's awesome that you're exploring. Um, you know, I think back to as an undergrad, I was all over the place. I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to, uh, you know, I don't know. I was into and then went back to grad school, and I would say this, but it's what I advise students, I'm actually more worried about the students who are like, I know exactly what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. <laughs> I actually worry more about them, because, well, what if this maybe goes a little that way, you know? So that's great that you guys are sort of, Jackson, that you're also using this to sort of explore. Okay, so maybe you guys, when we do talk, you guys can continue to sort of say your name, and we can just sort of build, um, a little rapport and get to know each other a little bit more. Okay, so they asked me to come talk about ways of thinking. Okay, so um, I'm not going to quiz you, but you know, you guys have got sort of your components of ways of thinking and those competencies. So of those, um, do any of you, so when you think about decision making, problem solving, ethics, idea generation, reflection, analytical reasoning, systems thinking, and planning. If you had to pick one, which one would you say, ah, I think that's most important, and why? Jackson. Yeah, you said a ton, but something that naturally... <laughs> well, you didn't study and read that website, but what do you think? Um, but the one that I naturally gravitated to out of all those was reflection. Uh, I think that you can learn so much from looking at the past and realizing how you can better to improve something. So that's what, that's what caught my eye. Ah, great, thank you. They have a slide. I wasn't sure how much you guys have talked about, not can it, with everything you've talked about in the components before, but okay. So great, I heard reflection, right? So these are the things that I rattled off up there. 
That is a, a great thought. Anybody else? Is, would anybody disagree and say, I put something else different? Yeah. Uh, for me, I would say ethics as, I guess, a sophomore cybersecurity, I deal with ethics all the time. It's like a huge part of what we do. We decide, you know, do you want to approach how is this issue ethical or not? And I think kind of thinking about what's ethical, what's not, what constitutes as ethical in a business setting versus in a personal setting, I think that's an important way to distinguish. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no right or wrong answer here, by the way. Um, anybody else disagree? Would anybody else pick a different one and why? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that systems thinking and planning uh, would be pretty important, like as a graduate of myself. Uh, I'm collecting data all the time, I'm, I'm processing like, results and looking at it. I can generally define like outcomes and which direction of a certain project is going. But what I really need help with uh, a lot of times is like my advisor will look at all of that and can, like, because of his experience, can tell me that that's not the direction. That yeah. you want to go. Yeah. But going down a rabbit hole, you should probably focus on like why are we doing this? And when you ask this question over and over again, you can concentrate on the big picture, which is yeah. sometimes that when you're working too intimately with like a project, then you can kind of forget about like why, like the central mission of whatever we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I my personal the one, the one thing that reflected to me the most was decision making and problem solving because okay. I feel that there are components uh, of the others which come in uh, to play uh, when you're doing decision making and problem solving. Personally, because uh, working in projects, you have to make a decision when you have to wrap up a project and move on. If it's not working for you, just uh, decide that it's not working for you and be open with your advisor in some sense. Yeah. Uh, problem solving requires uh, thinking about what your options are at the time, uh, yeah. uh, uh, valuing what uh, what are the pros and cons of each of the directions, and then trying to uh, take the best decision for you. So both, that's why I feel that different components come into that. Place. Yeah, okay. So I like the sort of hierarchy in the way that you're organizing and thinking about these as well, in terms of what's leading. Anybody put their money on idea generation? <laughs> Oh, we got one. Okay, good. Uh, I was kind of thinking, like, down the line of, like, if you aren't able to think outside the box and, like, create new ideas, then wherever you're at now, like, just remain stagnant. Mm. And you can't grow or do better from that. And ultimately, ultimately like, staying still will just kind of, like, go down. Yeah. You guys are all right. Um, there, and so I wanted to share sort of my thought, and I think before I get to that though, I would say you're all right in that, and I think it's going to vary as, when you, as you advance your thinking about leadership, you will, I think, begin to understand that it's also not stagnant nor fixed. It's always context dependent, and it always depends on the state you're in, the state others are in, what you're trying to accomplish, and it's going to evolve and ebb and flow. Um, are you under a high stress environment? Is there a crisis you're managing? Is that you know, it's always context dependent? And so as you learn these, there's not one way or truth. And knowing yourself, how you interact with the others around you and the context around you. And so in any given particular situation, one of these might sort of evolve as your leading in which the, the leading thought or competency in which you might organize the others. So I'll show when I read through these, my first thought, and, and I'm um, interpreting these in the context that I'm in now. For me, I look at these five and ethics leads first. But I'm right now in a position where leadership, even more than management, even though I've got a really big team, I've got great managers. It's very um, high level leadership and a lot of the problems and challenges and things I'm working on have really strong, if I don't get the ethics right, I'm totally hosed, right? <laughs> Completely and totally hosed. Um, and, and the other thing about that, because you know the things I do now, I'm interacting with, I'm thinking about all the faculty on campus, all the students on campus, all the staff on campus, all the time, and so, um, but that might have been, if you had asked um, engineer at Kraft Foods me, I might have been in a different position. 
right? Or have organized these differently. So you'll always be coming back and reflecting on your competencies, your own personal strengths, and sort of the situation you're in now. And so I wanted to talk a little bit to sort of start there with the ethics, and then we'll sort of build um, as well. Uh, you know, I think one of the most difficult, some of the most difficult challenges that leaders become faced with have components of ethics and values in them. It's where the big crash and burns live. It's where the big, huge mistakes that, I mean, you see this all the time. You think, wow, people who have had positions of leadership their entire, like you see presidents of universities, CEOs of companies who've had long, successful careers, right? These weren't people that were bumbling through and, you know, everybody makes mistakes, we all learn from failure, but they've generally been, by most definitions, successful. And then you see them make huge, catastrophic mistakes. And they almost always, I think, have some component of ethics and values. And so you just really, in a lot of the most difficult situations, it's where a lot of the landmines and pitfalls can be. And there's something I always, so you'll sort of learn too, I think, in these competencies, these like mental checkpoints for yourself of, and, and almost habits. So for me, one of the habits is, um, do you guys know the sunlight test or the sunshine test? Have you heard of this? Do you know what this is? Anybody familiar at all? Vaguely familiar. So the sun, or can you guess? What might the sunlight test be? Any guesses? Huh? Wait till the next morning. Well, wait till the, that could be what, wait till the next morning. Sunlight also brings other people's eyes onto your decision. So a lot of times, like, ethical conundrums will be like, well, would you do this if no one would find out? That's, that piece is sort of whether or not anybody would find out is actually sort of irrelevant. Instead, the sunshine test is, if, I, if this were on the front page, kind of in the morning the next day, if this were on the front page of the newspaper, if my decision, if my actions, if my approach, if my problem solving and what I decided is on the front page of the newspaper the next morning, can I, with a proud face, defend that? Right? And that's like a really good for me. And so it takes that whole piece, will anybody find out? Like, you know, there's a lot of those dilemmas. Would you cheat if nobody if you got away with it? To me, that, that part is totally irrelevant. And so for me, that is a really useful, like, little checkpoint for myself. Would I feel good and defend? Maybe even not feel good, but, you know, maybe you wouldn't feel good, but because a lot of really tough decisions, they're tough because there's always gains and losses. Somebody, you've got to balance things. But if you can truly justify it to the world, you know, I think that's a really great little checkpoint. And you'll learn for yourself along the way these competencies. When things seem really complicated, these sort of touchstones for how you might um, sort of reorient yourself to back to your values, back to your ethics, back to you know, these core competencies of leadership. Because they sound so obvious now, right? It, but when you get faced with really, really tough decisions and ways of communicating, and et cetera, these things will sort of come in handy. I don't know, does anybody have thought, any thoughts about that? If you remember nothing else, remember the sunlight test. <laughs> it, will, it will serve you well. Um, okay, I talked about that. And, you know, with that and the ethics, I think also... A checkpoint for me is often, you know, can you hold yourself to the same or higher standard as you hold others? So I said that a lot of these things sort of had different meanings at different points in my career. This one has a lot of meaning to me as a teacher, as an instructor, right? Your dear uh, instructors, your professors hold you to high standards. <laughs> yeah, they do, right? Um, but when I was teaching, you know, that sort of, you know, well, students need to learn, you know, deadlines and things like that. But can you flip that around and say, do I hold myself to those same or higher standards? And if the answer is no, then, you know, maybe your framework is 
may be a little flawed or problematic. And that will be, we'll get into a minute, um, talking a little bit about trust. Um, and I think these, this aspect of the comp, to be a great leader, people have to trust you. And there's lots of components to trust. You have to earn that. Um, and it's another reason why I think for me, and again, it's relative to the position I'm in now, that ethics for me leads. Um, the others are all critical. They all, but it, it's kind of like the hierarchy you were talking about, right? How you organize these. Um, and you guys stop and ask me like anything along the way. You can even ask me like really hard questions. Um, whatever, anything, anything is game. Um, so okay, so let's move on to the uh, so decision making, problem solving idea generation, reflection, analytical reasoning, systems thinking, and planning. When I first read these, it feels or sounds very, and maybe it's because I've got an engineering background, but I'm some neuroscience background, so we'll get to that too. Um, it sounds a little um, engineering-ish, design-ish, project management, creativity-ish. Um, when you bundle those, but I would actually, which feel very, um, like, like there's not a big people component to it, but I actually would turn that around and say that it's all people, and there's so much psychology in all of those things. And any good design project, any good um, creative project has a human component to it. And sometimes that's some of the most confusing part of it. So. The neuroscientist in me would say that, you know, the human brain is not always, we're not always super logical and super rational. And now as you're leading, you have to understand yourself and you have to understand the people around you. And now you have to problem solve and be creative and have teams. And it's very unlikely that one person ever has all the right answers, including you as a leader. That was a lot of sort of mumbo jumbo kind of stuff. Um, I said a lot of things. I'm curious just sort of how you're internalizing that. So would you say, of course, of course, idea generation and analytical reasoning has human psychology, human behavior components to it. It may depend on your discipline where you're coming from, whether that's obvious or not. Do you agree or disagree with me? You agree? Why do you agree? Uh, because the human factor is the one that you have the least control on, but it's the most important in my life. Yeah. I like that. That's good. Anybody else have thoughts about that? Do we have any do we have any majors? Do we have any psychology majors in here? Or anybody who studied psychology or brain behavior or anything like that? I have a theater degree, so like, <laughs> might as well. <laughs> well, but actually, you probably studied a lot of human behavior, I would yeah. suspect, in theater. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely did. Yeah. I was thinking, as you were talking about it, about being an extrovert. And so, um, and like, I work with Harry, and so Harry can definitely attest to the fact that I like to process, like, with other people. Yeah. And so, when I'm trying to, like, like process, uh, you know, a decision, or if we're trying, especially with brainstorming, and so if we're trying to think through something new we're going to do within our department, I want to do that with other people. Like yeah. I don't do that as well, just on my own in my own head. And so part yeah. of that for me is just I think being more of an extrovert. And so it's how I like to do that. But maybe someone that's more introverted. <laughs> I'm an extreme. I took the Myers Briggs that they sent away to New Jersey to be scored. The uh, person said he's never seen someone who's scored so far. I am extremely introverted. It doesn't mean I can't interact with people. It doesn't mean I yeah. can't do things. Stephanie likes to process with other people. I like to process before I engage with them. Mm -hmm. 
Because what I do is I want idea generation, and I want to think through the systems of it to figure out how things are going to work, and then I'm ready to talk to you. And Stephanie can attest to this. In meeting after meeting, she'll say, well, what do you guys think about that? And I very seldom say what I think about it. I wait till later. And so what I've learned, our team has a lot of introverts on it. And so I've learned if our staff meetings are going to have anything productive happen in them, I need to make sure I have shared the brainstorming topics ahead of time because my very gifted introverted team wants to process it on their own before they're able to talk about it in our staff meetings. So that's something I've had to adapt to yeah. as the extroverted leader of a group of very <laughs> introverted people. Like, I need to make sure that I give them what they need so that they yeah. can be themselves and their best selves in our meetings. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's such a great example. And here's a place where um, context is really important. So you described a situation with a well-defined team where you've gotten to know each other and you know something about sort of the brain and behavior of your team. And your team is self-aware and knows that about themselves. So if you're going into a situation where you don't know, for example, um, and, you've, or, and or you've got a large mix of people and you just assume that if you know something about the diversity of sort of human brain and behavior, you would design your idea generation process to accommodate the range, because that's how you're going to get your best ideas. So in that case, I might sort of yes and it, right, where some people are going to really generate and be comfortable producing their best ideas, interacting, processing with others like Stephanie does, and you're going to have others who are going to pro create their, like Harry, who are going to generate their best ideas after so the process and then they're going to share. So I would design an idea generation process that accommodated both and maybe had opportunities for both members to types or the di sort of diversity. But you have to know something a little bit about brain behavior then to do that design well. That's a really awesome example. And there's a lot of places where our brain tricks us. This is like our brain, I mean, it was evolved for that. One of the first things they teach you in, um, or one of the, I don't know, they always teach you, but one of the sort of aha or things they point out early in when you're studying neuroscience is that we all have a little spot where the nerve comes through in our retina where it gathers, where you're not, where you actually go like this, you've got a blind spot. Everybody's got a blind spot. But you don't see a dark spot, your brain fills it in, right? You go, oh, I didn't know. There's like actually no information coming from that spot. It's about right here. If you close your eyes, go like this, and move your finger over, the tip of your finger will disappear. Have, everybody, have you guys ever done this before? Do you know no. what that is? Yeah, if you close one eye, go like this, put your finger like right at eye level, and just really slowly start to move it out. The tip of your finger will disappear about right here. Right, but your brain, your brain fills it in. Right, your brain is always filling in. <laughs> right? And so your brain, you can, if you're not sort of aware about these things, you can sort of, um, your brain can mislead you. <laughs> Almost, if you will. And so that's why a lot of this self-awareness. And also knowing that the human brain is also flawed in other types of ways. So there was just in, in um, NPR, you ever listen to the Hidden Brain? Anybody even know what that is? Cool people. When you get older, maybe you'll listen. <laughs> when you have, or when you have more time. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you never will. Um, anyway, the Hidden Brain has, and I was just listening in the car ride, and they were talking about um, we always, we tend to, when we first meet people, um, underestimate whether or not they like us. <laughs> and they gave this, this huge study with college roommates um, that didn't know each other. You come together, both roommates would always think that the other person didn't like them more than they actually liked them. And that gap in what I think you think of me and what you really think of me, they found didn't begin to narrow, it persisted for months, the whole year. It wasn't until like the end of the school year did it begin to close 
And this was just like, and I was like, that's really interesting. So that influence, so there's always this internal monologue going on in your own brain of what other people are thinking about you, right? And you can't let that influence, you have to be sort of self-aware about that. You can't let your ego get out in front of you and become insecure and let that drive your decisions. So that's another place where sort of the brain and behavior um, comes into it. And so um, another thing, so I would say there's so much psychology in all of this. And to think about those human components in every layer of um, these competencies. Okay. So when I read these two, and when I think about leadership, there's a lot of strategy. Leadership, and leadership is different than management. There's all these great, like, Harvard Business Review articles and things about management versus leadership, and they're, and they're they overlap, but they're different. Okay, and I'm gonna, and I'm going to say that leadership. There's a lot of strategy. Leadership leaders are great strategists, and what does that mean? There's a lot in here that you need to do to develop a great strategy for moving forward. And I also want to give a little bit of credit. So, I've been through lots of leadership training, this and that, since you know, since I said since I was maybe like 18 um, here at Purdue. And I want to give a little bit of credit to one of the. Um, more recently, I went through um, a leader, an executive leadership training for women in STEM, in particular, and uh, and they brought in all these thinkers, and and there's a guy named Rick McKnight who came and spoke to us. And he's probably he said things that really resonated with me, and I want to give him credit for this. And he points to lots of places, so I just wanted to say his name out loud because some of these ideas I really I learned from him. And a lot, especially a lot of these thoughts um, about strategy. So he would tell you that um, some of the best strategists are mindful and have very high and develop high emotional intelligence, if you will. So this is an old idea. There's a famous book in the 1990s about emotional intelligence. Is, are you guys familiar with that term? What does it mean to you? I see a head shaking in the gold here. Not to put you on the spot, but. Um, but I'm gonna. Uh, for me, emotional intelligence is uh, kind of like how well you can understand other people's emotions and like respond accordingly. Yeah, that's a good one. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, for me, it's also just being self-aware and knowing your own emotions because I feel like a lot of people struggle with that. Yep. Well, so very good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you guys pretty much nailed it, right? that you can recognize, be aware, um, understand and manage your emotions and the emotions of other people. Again, the strategy stuff all comes down to so much psychology. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious because I was, I was just kind of like thinking about the words and when you like go to define like a word like leadership, I think everyone in this room would define leadership differently. Mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to think about how you were defining strategy, for example. And I was like, does she mean planning and coordination, execution? Uh, so I, I was just looking for some more insight on how you personally were defining strategy when you meant that great leaders are great strategists. Yeah, okay, happy to do that. Yeah, I mean, there's multiple components in what you just described as one of them, right? That execution and how. I mean, I think there's different layers. There is definitely one is, is do you have an idea or a vision of where you want to get to that is meaningful and worthwhile. So first that, um, what, where, how, what it is you want to accomplish, right? And, and it's got to be, um, like I said, meaningful and worthwhile. Then there is the component that you described. You have to have a good plan for executing and for getting there, right? So this sort of, there is an implementation side of it. And then there's a third component that is like really the human side. Do you have the right team? Are the people and all of those things? And then there's layers of resources. Do you have the resources you need to accomplish it? And resources can be all sorts of things. Space, time, money, um, you know, the trust you build of other people is a resource. Um, and any strategy has um, headwinds and tailwinds to it. In other words, there are forces that are going to make it harder for you to get to where you want to be, and there's forces that are going to make it easier 
for you to get to where you want to be. Um, and a good leader, then their job is to sort of influence those forces to overcome the things that are going to make it harder and to get momentum from the things that are going to push you in the direction that is the vision of where you want to get to. I think, in my mind anyway, a lot of that um, maybe doesn't distill down to a clear, succinct strategy, but in my mind, that's a lot of the components of strategy, if that makes sense. And so as a leader, a lot of times, you're, you're influencing and you're, you're like nudging these forces. It's very rarely that you're like, do that. <laughs> I make it so, right? We think of like leadership as a position of power. And if I get to the next position, I'll just tell people what to do. It does not work that way, right? So strategy becomes a really critical part of being a leader. Does that kind of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a lot of great buzzwords that you said through that. that <laughs> Buzzer. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. Yeah, so I mean these... Um, so there's components, right? I, I, I understand my own feelings. I can regulate my own feelings. Um, I can accurately predict how others might feel to what I say, do, and present. Knowing that there's probably gonna be, almost always, a diversity of, so here's an example, we talk about stories, right? We talk about Protect Purdue, like through the whole, um, so I've been on the Protect Purdue leadership team um, from pretty early on. And on the same day, on any given day, you can have people at the tales of opinion on opposite ends of the spectrum, yelling at you, telling you you're such an idiot about, no, really, right? An individual voice. Yelling at you through the phone, through the email. Who would, if you put those two in a room together, like total ends of the spectrum, right? So how do you operate sort of in that and knowing that there's gonna be, how do you lead when there's a huge diversity of individual opinion, needs, perspectives, et cetera, right? That's a place where, and they get very emotional, right? You know, and especially even to debt, like, you know, we get comments on anything, and in the, in the public environment, on Twitter and everything, right, they're really extreme. So being able to, there's a lot of emotional self-regulation to be able to step back, not be personally offended or hurt by what somebody says. Often there's a real nugget, understanding their motivation. Why do they feel that way? Right? What is going on in their life? They're obviously very passionate about it. Right? And, and not in like being able to read into it and sort of think, being, being able to rise above it and reflect that there's something to learn from both voices and why and try to understand a little bit. So that, um, you know, and, and that you're never going to make every single person out there sort of happy, love, and adore you of what you did. That's not the point, right? And if you're always trying to optimize for that, that's going to be really tough and, and probably lead you into some directions that don't make sense. If, I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah. This is a place where I think a lot of the emotional, you know, and this is where I talk about tricks and process. You'll sort of learn tricks and process for managing. Like, you're going to have emotions, but to be able to step out of it, you know, and you develop a process like, okay, I get an angry email. I'm not going to respond right away, right? I'm going to, I'm going to let it sink. And maybe I need to have my moment where I need to like vent to my husband or in some context where it doesn't, right? It just helps me process my emotions. You have to sort of know what that is. And then, okay, I did that. I got that out. Now I can go back and read that angry email or whatever and look at it with a new eye in order to extract the knowledge that's there. 
and then to have, you know, empathy is huge, 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 huge. And you also find communication in here in these steps. Um, you know, it's real easy to write an angry email. I almost always pick up the phone. Let's talk, <laughs> right? And you get to a whole different place on the phone, right? And sometimes that angry email is just part of their processing, their own processing, right? Um, so I'm big on, you know, so much of the really tough. I think if you can get so much of the mindfulness um, around your emotions and then you get the ethics right, you know, and these other areas, they're so critical too. Like, you know, we're in the methods for that. But for me, and, and it's probably in the role, right? I'm, you know, and I'm probably coming off, I mean, last two years I've been thinking about how do you keep people safe and alive in a pandemic while still learning? Like, you're really influencing people's livelihoods, right? It was like literally very, um, felt very life and death and big impact on people's lives. And so it's probably a reason, now as I reflect in real time as you're standing here, you know, is probably a big reason why ethics to me is rising in this moment in this leadership position that I've been in in the last two years that I've experienced. It's probably a reason why ethics for me right now is elevating to the top. It might be back in two years. Maybe it'll be idea generated <laughs> at that time. Um, and probably another reason why, so to get, any, to get your teams along in, so laying out good plans for idea generation, laying out good processes for reflection and analytical reasoning, and especially almost everything we do, we do so much in teams, right? And for any of those to be effective for a leader, people have to trust you. Right? They just really do. If you want, if people don't trust you, that's a really tough place to be in. Um, can you think of, and you don't have to tell me who, um, but can you think of like situations even now and in your life where like, oh, whether or not you trust, what, what makes you trust a leader? Let's just start with that. What makes you trust a leader? What if some leader comes up and I've got, you know, they, they present to you a decision-making framework for how you guys are going to decide some big problem that's going to solve, you know, uh, affect the lives of other people. What makes you trust the person who's presenting that to you or not trust the person that's presenting this to you? Yeah. Credibility and responsibility, maybe? Good ones, yes. So, so um, uh, a leader should be established by what work he has done, right? Like, uh, yeah. so if it is a credible person who I know have accomplished so many things, it, it, it might not be a good leader. That's why I said both of the uh, yeah. things to get comes together. And whatever a leader says, he should be responsible for it, uh, at, or like for the vision, responsible for the vision, yeah. and the part of ethics come through it. So yeah. that these two are the words that I thought would be uh, 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 attributed to someone who I would be, yeah. who would be presenting an idea to me. So. Yeah, that's great. I like that. Those are excellent. Anybody else? was as complex as hers, but uh, honestly, uh, when it comes to me, I get persuaded a little too easily, so if someone is usually oh. genuine and authentic, I'm kind of like, are you, like, okay, let's go. Okay, you know what, those are all, like, I would say, so I like your answer in two ways. One, you, you, you're self-aware, something about yourself, and how you respond to others, and I think that authenticity I think there's something real to that too, right? So actually all of these things that I've heard from the three of you really come together and I think are really critical components of um, being, you know, of developing trust. 
and that sort of trustworthy, that you have a track record of, right, that you can demonstrate in the past that you have been trustworthy too, right? So the, you guys did great. That was awesome. You guys did really, really um, good, good with that one. I agree totally. And I know, do you guys have more stuff? You got to fit in at the end. I'm talking a lot. <laughs> Saying your thing is so great, and you're doing valuable on something. It's wonderful. Okay. And I hate to interrupt you. It's professors can sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> My husband tells me, like, okay, <laughs> wrap it up, not a lecture. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, we do have some other Okay. Well, I just have, let me throw in one more quick thing, and then I'll wrap it up and be done. Okay. Um, and you guys can invite me back some other time or. Never see me again. <laughs> Whichever you want to do. Two thoughts that I want to share with you. As you're thinking about these competencies and through, as you're developing your competencies and you're developing and thinking about your personal strengths and areas of development, remember that every strength and excess can be a weakness. Okay? Every strength and excess can be a weakness. And that comes in knowing about yourself too. Right? If you're competitive, that could be a strength. In excess, it could be aggressive, right, and, and really problematic. Every, you can't think of a strength that in excess. And play out in different situations. And that your strengths play out in different situations and interact with the strengths of those on your teams in different ways. So that's just something else to be, to think about um, as well. Okay. The last thing I want to say, and this connects with uh, some of the leadership. I know this is a little, this gets a little, sometimes I present this one to students and they go, what? This is getting a little like, I don't know what. But, and this, and this comes from my friend Rick McKnight too, and this is something, you know, there's different types of leadership styles and you'll get to know yours. One that resonated, resonated a lot with me, with a lot of the things we've been talking about today, is being a mindful strategist. I know this sounds very like, you know, I don't know what. Um, but meditation, actually, that reflection, that meditation is really important. And the definition in this context of a mindful strategist, that you are able to calm your mind on demand anytime, anywhere, right? Step one. So imagine we had University Senate today, right? 104, um, you know, members, mostly faculty, we know faculty are never opinionated, right? No. <laughs> right, and they're 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 never they never challenge administration, right? Right. So today's meeting was great, but, but you know you can imagine standing in front of in the role I'm at, I could very easily be in front of an angry mob of whoever, right, at any time, or very confrontational, right? I could be really confronted with someone who's really upset about something that's happening at any moment in time, right? So in that moment, do I get wrapped up in my own emotions? Do I get defensive? Do I start uh, becoming insecure about, you know, or in that moment, can I stay calm, right? And really take in objectively what people are saying to me and process that in a way that I don't that I'm calm and don't overreact, right? Um, and then are you able to gain insight into what is real anytime, anywhere? So again, this is kind of like, that's what I was talking about, the tricks, like this situation of people underestimating what other people think of them, right? There's just some, we're really bad at, it's like our human brain is just really bad at predicting some things. We either over or underestimate things a lot. Um, and when we're stressed, we're more likely to take um, ambiguous information and assign it a negative value. So we're more likely to sort of sway in the negative too when we're stressed. And so being able to not only stay calm, but can I extract like real insight and meaning from what's happening in real time. That takes a lot of practice and a lot of um, just yeah, a lot of practice and a lot of thought. And then, I really like this one. The third component is, use oneself as a positive force 
all the time, everywhere one goes. So I talked a lot about like leadership, and we talked about strategy, and I'm talking about there's things going to be working against you, and there's things going to be working for you, and you're trying to get that way, right? So this is that always being a positive force for trying to get where I'm trying to go. Not only in the strategy, it's not a means to end, but everything I'm doing is contributing to, uh, I'm being productive, I'm being positive, I'm, keep, I'm helping others in one way or another. I'm not knocking people down. I'm not, you know, even if I disagree with people, I'm not, I can disagree and share my concern or my opinions without knocking them down or being a negative force or being, you know, and, and this is sort of, there's emerging, we didn't even get into like collaboration and mediation and all that kinds of thing. But I really subscribe, you know, to a collaborative, negotiation sort of place where if I can align, think about, you know, where you're trying to get to, where I'm trying to get to, and really think about where the other person is. Um, so I just wanted to show that because I really, really love it. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of these, these components of the ways of thinking sort of fit in and wrap up um, in this strategy, which involves all of these ideas, right? Idea generation, you gotta sort of know where you wanna to get to, and these others are components of how you might get there. And, and like I said, if your ethics are screwed up, your host. <laughs> There's no point in any of it, right? Um, and the last thing I'll say, you know, that all that sounds, it sounds almost like transcendental, meditative, rising above, but as you, Think about, you know, there's other models that sort of study um, positions of power. And if you think about from a power, leadership from a power angle, sort of the more power or influence you have, the more you are giving it away, if that makes sense. Like, in my role now, the most important thing I can be doing is empowering others. So I'm not using my position to, like, execute and decide and determine things. I am, I'm sort of using my position to give voice to others with a productive process that will get to a good decision or resolution, if that makes sense. Um, and that's sort of the last thing. And all of these components of the ways of thinking competency are, um, their skills, their competencies that you'll practice and develop to work towards those all these sort of higher things of leadership that I was talking about. Okay, I will stop talking because I've been talking a lot. <laughs> let's, let's. That was really good. It really was. And, and since you offered, we will ask you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, cool. Definite, definite. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to yeah. Eileen. She has some administrative things that uh, she needs to take care Hello. Hello. Okay. okay. So we had an activity plan. We're going to skip it for today. So just administration stuff. No, you would no problem. Um, so there's some learning resources that we have available for you if you want to um, develop your um, competencies a little more. So we have the self-guided modules, and I put bitly links here. You'll also get um, a PDF version of this PowerPoint and then post event email from me. So um, don't worry about that. Uh, we also have experiential learning resources if you're looking to enhance one of one of the competencies or a quadrant of the competencies. We've got some um, resources there for you of activities that you can partake in to develop your competencies. And then congrats by being here. You're one step closer to earning the certificate of completion. Again, attend four of the six events in the series to earn the certificate from the Roger C. Stewart Leadership and Professional Development Department and as well as student activities and organizations. So with that being said, the next events are coming up on Wednesday. This was actually scheduled for last Thursday, but because of the snow, we rescheduled it. So we have one more coming up on Wednesday at 5.30. And then we also have another one coming up next Monday at 5.30. Um, this one's on goal setting. So again, you'll get the information in a post event email. Here is the promotion for our high community, as we've been mentioning. And the first coffee chat is going to be Wednesday, March 2nd at 4 o'clock. And we have our special guest, Roger C. Stewart, who will be joining us. So this is a casual conversation you can have um, with Roger. And we're going to be talking about the leadership competencies and specifically communication.
education is what he's going to be talking about. So if you want to join this event, definitely join our community because uh, the events are posted on the community events page. And that is all we have for you. If you have any questions, you can email Harry. Um, for the latest updates and announcements, definitely follow us on social media um, because things do change, weather happens. So if you want to get the most updated news, uh, definitely do that. Thank you so much for being here, and I'm going to bring back the attendance for some of you.